Tennessee ranks second to none in the caliber of statesmen she has produced. She has also given the world some of the most colorful politicians in our country's history. This album is dedicated to eight of those men who have served or are serving our state now. Presented first is a good-natured spoof of each one, highlighting some facet of his career, followed by a serious but informal reflection by the man himself on some phase of his personal philosophy. The icing on the cake is the finale, an original recitation for the album by a man whose nonpartisan influence on this nation has had profound effect, Johnny Cash. This is an album you will enjoy and treasure and preserve for your children. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your reporter, Benny Williams, with station WGOP. And tonight, we're on the scene at the annual Tennessee Republican fundraising dinner. This year's dinner is being held in a Detroit automobile factory. I'm told that someone in the White House thought he had a better idea. And in order to make sure that none of the present dignitaries would be recalled for being a defective model, or traded in for newer models, or else junked because of the miles on them, we're here in Detroit. I'm sure in uh, this assembly there are several loose nuts, but have no fear. We also have with us the distinguished doctor, Nat Winston, with his prolific psychoanalytic prognosis of the present political proceedings. One man in particular has had a lot of pull in Tennessee's political matters. So let's hear Dr. Knapp's dissertation on the doings of what's been done. Though the state of Tennessee was in a democratic slump, and we sought to find a man who could pull us over the hump. We searched in every corner to find the perfect one. When a star rose from the west, his name, Winfield Dunn. He shone out in the dark like a set of new false dentures, and all across the state we knew we were in for new adventures. From a barely audible whisper when he first began to run, the chant built up to a clamoring roar. Winfield Dunn's the one, Winfield Dunn's the one. The race was tough and fiercely fought, but his race was fairly run, and when the last vote was counted, Winfield Dunn had won, Winfield Dunn had won. Immediately, he took control of Tennessee's ship of state, and he crossed our skies in a Learjet at an unbelievable rate. Why he charged back and forth across the state, his dental drill in his hand, leaving a mighty legacy and filling the cabin in the land. A medical school and a new paved road up in East Tennessee, and a prison in Morristown named after him the Dunn Academy. There are other achievements we could name but when all is said and done, the people point their finger and say, Winfield Dunn's the one. Winfield Dunn's the one. But now the Democrats have come back in. And with the Republicans' insatiable thirst, they point to the previous reign and say, Winfield Dunn the first. Winfield Dunn the first. Governor Dunn is now approaching the microphone for a few tongue-in-cheek remarks. After cleaning many plates and the voids he has filled, his words of wisdom remain with us still. There's a good bit of talk in Tennessee today that the average citizen isn't interested in politicians and shows very little interest in his government. I remain completely unconvinced of that statement and I think there's a great deal of proof to bear out what I feel. I feel there's a greater interest in Tennessee government today than ever before. I believe the people of Tennessee who are paying the taxes, who are reading the newspapers and trying to understand what elected representatives are doing in Nashville and in the local communities of the state, truly are concerned about the result of those activities. People, it seems to me, have one great fear in Tennessee today, and I think it can be 
transposed over to the broader spectrum of America. They don't want their government to overwhelm them. They're concerned because it appears today that government is dictating a policy which says that social services have got to be provided to people regardless of fiscal responsibility. I think people fear their country is becoming dangerously close to a bankrupt position and they want to do something about it. State government, it seems to me, offers the best avenue through which the people can voice their concerns and affect changes which will renew our federal system and give states the kind of strength and the role to play which will keep the fiber of America strong. So I believe the people of Tennessee are going to continue to be interested in who they see as their governor, who their congressmen are, and who serves in the city councils and on the county courts. They've shown a new sophistication politically in our state. I believe the two-party system, which is alive and well, will continue to provide our people with access to the minds of its political leaders. And it's my fond hope that as the years and as the decades go by, Tennessee will continue to be strengthened by active participation on the part of the everyday citizen who can make a real difference in what government does. dearly loved in my home state, and rightly I should be. My heritage goes back far. My parents preceded me to the hallowed halls of Congress, certainly my Tennessee. I started this whole Republican thing, and I know you plainly see there'd be no done Brock or Beard if it hadn't been for me. You ask me how I did these things all single-handedly. It's really a very simple matter. I speak so fluently. Why, I can speak on Courthouse Square before a gathered crowd and speak for hours and never pause with stentorial voice and laugh. At times, words flow from my mouth in such metered metaphor that even I am carried away and articulate some more. Why, even I get frightened when I hear my words at times flowing from my silver tongue in articulated rhymes. My oratorical ability was enhanced, I must confess, when I was before the national eye in the Watergate cover-up mess. It was there that I reached new heights in my speaking abilities, outshining my Senate colleague with engaging pomply. I handled myself so well, in fact, in all humility, a groundswell began for me to seek our country's presidency. Well, all that's behind me now, and things have settled down, and I guess I'll go back to strip mining in Huntsville, my hometown. Since Fanny outfoxed a certain politician, there's even talk of the stripping of mines over in East Tennessee. Howard Baker of the now defunct TV series Watergate plans to possibly star in a new major role with a premiere on Pennsylvania Avenue in the fall instead of continuing his reruns. Politics is probably more personal in America than in any other country I know of. There are fewer professional politicians, so-called, in the United States, I suspect, than there are in Italy or France, certainly in the Soviet Union or People's Republic of China, where it's a way of life and authoritarian in the last possible degree. Politics is sometimes referred to as a sport in the United States because it takes on that atmosphere from time to time, but it's a deadly serious business. The fact, however, that American political effort has been a citizen effort rather than a professional effort, I think, is significant and important and worth preserving for the future of the country. It's worth noting, I believe, as I have noted from time to time, that the two-party system in the United States is not provided for in the Constitution or even by statute law, for that matter, and it's uniquely American. I believe it exists nowhere else in the world that is too broad-based national parties who are not ideologically aligned but have a conservative or a liberal bent or a shift in their center of gravity depending on what their nominees and a majority of their workers profess to believe from time to time. But I think that's served this country well. Over the entire span or almost the entire span of the existence of the country, the two-party system in one form or the other has functioned. 
It serves a good purpose. It, it serves as a vehicle for people to gather together and express similar views, to exchange ideas, to hear and understand the differing points of view of their fellow citizens. It may even be that the two-party system is the principal device by which we knock off the rough edges of our disagreements in politics and translate our thoughts into workable governmental action. I'm a strong believer in the two-party system and the Republican Party and its usefulness to the country, but mostly I have a strong feeling that there's something almost providential about the success of the political system in the United States and its promise for the future. from Tennessee. My grandfather had been there too, and it was a very, very thing to do. I started out to make my mark, and I found the going to be a lark. <laughs> I started out at Macaulay School, and there I play in the Golden Rule. I studied hard and always polite. I soon was known as Teacher's Delight. I worked so hard they rewarded me by presenting me the Founder's Key. <laughs> While I was there, I met a guy who had the same ambition as I. Howard Baker was his name, and the two of us were headed for fame. We were both to rise to heights of glory, but how we got there is a different story. <laughs> and so I entered the congressional race for selling candy was never my place and off to Washington I went and in the Congress four terms I spent my constituents they loved me so they urged me for the Senate to go Baker got there before, so I set my sights on Albert Gore. I beat him out, and I'll predict that I'll go back in 76. And now we reign supremely, and we're known by the name of BNB. &B. <laughs> oh, yeah, now there is in the years to come a possibility that I will run for a higher seat. I will not name but the title carries even greater pain. You have no idea to what I refer, but the White House is the home I prefer. For I am the senator from Tennessee, and a mighty good senator too. I'm very, very good, and be it understood, I will do anything for you. I'm always at my post, and I'm never known to boast, and my friends are men of no, and I'm never known to fear. Though my enemies may sneer And I've never missed a Senate vote What never? No, never What never? Well, <laughs> hardly ever I've hardly ever missed a Senate vote So give three cheers And your glasses a knock For a hearty Senator Bill Brock Give three cheers and your glasses are not for a hearty Senate for Bill Brock. And now here's the senator from East Tennessee who has a sweet tooth and sometimes finds himself in a sticky situation. people, there is nothing that we can't accomplish, no goal that we cannot seek and achieve unless we impose a limit upon ourselves uh, through the actions of our government. We are free to choose our government. We are free to choose what kind of government, what kind of limits that government imposes on us. But if we decide at some point in time that an element of security is more important to us than the, than the excitement of freedom, then that security requires 
a price in the form of our personal options. I think that's the fundamental choice facing America today. Uh, do we opt for more security and less personal responsibility? Do we choose the, uh, the supportive role of government to ensure our own uh, security, the livelihoods that we have, or do we seek to earn our opportunities through our own efforts, our own production? The history of democracy and the, and the history of man is one of, of those democracies being faced with threats from domestic or international uh, sources. And when a family is faced with the choice of security or freedom, and when a father has to make a decision between feeding his children and, or not doing so, the option is too often forced uh, on the side of security and against the side of, of personal freedom. And that's the that's the very delicate and difficult choice we have to face today. Are we willing to accept the risk and the challenges and the opportunities of freedom, or are we going to impose upon others, our fellow citizens, and the taxes that are necessary to ensure at least temporarily our own security? politician goes for the two-party system. If Nashville isn't the place to throw a couple, then try cities like Jimmy Quillen does. America is a great land of opportunity, and with all the problems facing us today, we should not be discouraged. Rather, it should encourage us to go forward to build a better land in which to live, improve our government, and do the things necessary to help people of this country. Tennessee has played a great role in the history of our country, sending three presidents of the United States to Washington to run the country and to do great things for the people. One of those presidents came from the first district of Tennessee which I represent. Andrew Johnson came to Greenville as a young boy 
and did everything in the world to pull himself out of poverty, and he did, serving the people in every office of the land. And finally, as President of the United States, in an area of conflict, of problems, but he did everything that he could to solve them. And his lesson and his efforts should be a reminder of us today to go forward and do the things necessary to solve our problems and not be discouraged, but to go forward and protect and preserve our two-party system for the benefit of all Americans. You are done. My name is John Duncan, and I don't care what you heard, I'm not no country bumpkin. They claim that I can't read here tell the time of day, but book learning ain't everything is all I got to say. For see, I've learned the facts of life. You can't learn them in school. Like you made a Jenny and a Jack, and you wind up with a mule. I go throughout my district, and I play this country bit just to throw my people off and they, they don't see through it. For I've got this thing figured out as to how to play the game. It's called a double switch, for want of a better name. You send one boy to either side in a hotly contested race, and then you strap the top of the fence and put on your country face. There's one inherent danger in assuming this kind of pose. You could fall down upon the wire and run a split right up your clip. The big question tonight is Congressman John still dunking donuts, or can he not find them for the whole? <laughs> Congressman Duncan, it's been said the way you inched into politics and got your foot in the door, is because you have two rules that you go by. Is this true? It's always been my policy that the best politics is to do the job that you are elected to do. We have a, a set of written rules in my office. Uh, among those, uh, number one is that the poorest man in my district has the same right to my time as the wealthiest. Number two is that we always try to be helpful, that we can usually do something about any problem if we work and try, at least we give the effort first before we give an excuse. Among others, that uh, we always uh, try to be helpful to everyone and treat everyone courteously. I'm a Mara Bates and a gentleman through and through. I never raise my voice. I'm sure you know it's true. I've never lost my temper in an obvious kind of way. But buddy, don't you cross me. I'll have the final say. I get things done in quiet ways. I'm sure you realize. I sit and listen patiently and never blink my eye. When you come into my office, I may strike you as a bore, but you'll never know till you've gone out you've been cut down to the floor. I'm a conscientious person, and I come home when I can. I move throughout my district with a countenance that's blank. I shake hands with my people, and I'm never, never blunt. But they don't know the power that lies behind my front. You see, I have succeeded in fooling everyone. They think that I'm too nice and easily made to run. But I tell you, friends and neighbors, they're in for quite a fright, for I am Lamar Baker, third district's dynamite. One man baked a legislative loaf and proved to be self-rising. While most folks slept, late hours he kept a dedicated lawmaker. Without further ado, we introduce you to a man named Lamar Bates. This is indeed a great nation in which we live and a great deal of effort and work. And as Winston Churchill said, blood, sweat, and tears have been put into its development. I believe in America and I believe in our free enterprise system. I believe we should do everything possible as individuals rather than looking to the state or the federal government to do for us. 
we need to uh, cultivate the strengths of our youth, the strengths of our ability. I too am a fiscal conservative. I believe in a balanced budget in normal times. I believe we need to uh, maintain, maintain some sort of reservoir whereby we can uh, take up the slack and, the, and endure the shock of uh, unusual and critical times. We may come to the point where we'll find that our national debt is such a tremendous burden that it's hard to overcome some emergencies into which we might, uh, might run and might find ourselves. I look forward to uh, the future. I want everything good for America, and I think we have everything good working for us. It's up to individuals. It's up to groups. It's up to the private sector. And it's up to our federal officials, those who represent the people, to make sure that the best is held for those who will come after us. Who killed Cock Robin? I said this guy with my little bow and arrow. I killed Cock Robin. Now, if there's anything I hate, it's that there nursery rhyme. The press is always writing those to hurt me all the time. Then there is that other one, that little Robin Redbreast. Why, everybody knows that I've got hair upon my chest. Why, I'm the toughest feller that you will ever see. And I'm not afraid of anyone in the state of Tennessee. I ride throughout the six, and at every chance I talk to anyone who listens. Why, I'm the cock of the walk. If you listen very carefully, as the press is sure to do, You'll hear my battle cry, it's cock a doodle doo And to say that I am really tough and one that should be feared, I do have hair upon my chest. I'm the Robin with the beard. Now, I could be underhanded, but I wouldn't if I could, for there's one name I never want, and that is Robin the Hood. And I would point out one more thing and make this observation. I'm the youngest one of all in the congressional delegation. When the river of life is broad and deep and you begin to falter, I will always come to help you for I can walk across the water. Things have run afoul on the national political scene and the bird population in the 6th district of Tennessee became so large that a robin took wing and spotted Washington, D.C. One of the difficult things about being in public life is that you don't have much of a chance to be sentimental. Webster defines sentimental as being marked or governed by feeling or emotional idealism. Marked or governed by feeling or emotional idealism. It's almost a derogatory phrase, certainly not one we'd want to ascribe to someone responsible for making important decisions that could have far-reaching effects on our futures at least not in these complicated times. It's just not an acceptable trait for a public figure. And more than one politician in modern times has seen his career ended because of a reaction to something the public considered too sentimental. When I used to get sentimental, back before I became a public figure, of course, I guess, like everyone else, I would think about the way things used to be when I was a boy growing up in Middle Tennessee. Things were different then, it seems. We walked to school and we didn't worry about getting mugged on the way. We got out of high school or college, we joined the service because that's what we had to do. And then we got a job. But then it was a question of what we wanted to do, not whether there would be a job, any job available when we were ready to go to work. Criminals back then were treated like criminals, not victims of social injustice, and they were punished accordingly. But most important, I think, America was still a land of opportunity where the American dream flourished and anybody with a little initiative and a little luck could still make his dream come true. Now, of course, things are different. Our country has grown and so has our government. And because we've grown, our government has decided that rational decisions based on mathematical statistics must take precedence over local ways of life, which have traditionally been based on, after all, emotional idealism about the way we want our families to live. So now we bust our children to school to comply with mathematical statistics. The government tells us how to run our businesses. 
and our schools, and soon it looks like they'll be telling us what we can do with the property we own. All these decisions, of course, are based on the rational premise that what is good for the majority must be right. There's just no room for the old idealism anymore. Not long ago, my nine-year-old son asked me why I wanted to be a congressman. Someday I'll tell him that I wanted him to know the same life I did when I grew up in Tennessee that I wanted him to have the same opportunities I had when I was a young man. Maybe he'll think I'm being sentimental, but maybe by then being sentimental won't be such a bad thing. Many a tale has been told about the men from Tennessee, Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone, and then there was Sam McGee. But one stands out or all the rest, you know who I mean, of course, Dan Kirkendall from Memphis, the Tennessee talking horse. The name was not given to him without thinking it through and through. They wanted to give him a name, you see, that all would know was true. Swashbuckling and flamboyant and possessed of considerable flair, he could have been called a jackass, but that would have been unfair. There are times, however, I'm told, when you're expecting a horse's neigh, if you'll listen very intently, it sounds much more like a break. But even that's not too bad for taking all at its best. He could have been called the eastern end of a horse that is headed west. He is the unquestioned authority on any subject you name. And he's raised himself by his mouth to unbelievable fame. And if in the night you hear hoof beats loud and coarse, Without any question, you'll know it's the Tennessee talking horse. Dan Kirkendall is with us tonight. Now, Dan's been known for his many nays in Congress. Do you believe politics is a stable profession, Dan? chuckled along with other Tennesseans about the label of the Tennessee talking horse, and I've always been reminded of some advice given to me my, by my mother many years ago, who said, be careful uh, how your words taste, because when you have to eat them later, uh, you're going to have to think it over. Well, even though I've had this uh, label of the Tennessee talking horse, I think that even in my career, which ended up with losing uh, a political race, I found that the plain-spoken, sometimes outspoken, a Republican uh, Tennessee way of saying things and doing things has to be the future of our political system. Uh, we have to tell the people the way things are and as they are uh, if we're going to ever uh, really restore this great country of ours to the stature which we know that it can achieve and has achieved in the past under the kind of leadership given by some of our great Tennessee leaders. So uh, even though I'm speaking to you now as a, a former congressman, one that was defeated, uh, I have no disillusionment with our system. It is a great system, this, this one of politics. And not only do I have no regrets about my eight years of service to you, it was the finest eight years of my life and will be uh, a memory to me the rest of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Cash. I am the nation. I was born on July 4th, 1776, and the Declaration of Independence is my birth certificate. The bloodlines of the world run in my veins because I offered freedom to the oppressed. I am many things and many people. I am the nation. I am 200 million living souls and the ghost of millions who have lived and died for me. I am Nathan Hale and Paul Revere. I stood at Lexington and fired the shot heard around the world. I am Washington, Jefferson, Patrick Henry. I am John Paul Jones, the Green Mountain Boy, and David Crockett. Lee, Grant, and Abe Lincoln. I remember the Alamo, the Maine, and Pearl Harbor. 
When freedom called, I answered and stayed until it was over over there. I left my heroic dead in Flanders fields and on the rock of Corregidor, on the bleak slopes of Korea and in the steaming jungles of Vietnam. I am the Brooklyn Bridge, the wheat lands of Kansas and the granite hills of Vermont. I am the coal fields of the Virginias and Pennsylvania, the fertile lands of the West, the Golden Gate and Grand Canyon. I am Independence Hall, the Monitor. I am the Merrimack. I am big. I sprawl from the Atlantic to the Pacific. My arms reach out to embrace Hawaii and Alaska. Three million square miles. I'm more than three million farms. I'm forest, field, mountain, and desert. I'm quiet villages, and I'm cities that never sleep. You can look at me and see Ben Franklin walking down the streets of Philadelphia with his bread loaf under his arm. You can see Betsy Ross with her needle. You can see the lights of Christmas and hear the strains of all laying aside as the calendar turns again. I'm Babe Ruth in the World Series. I'm 130,000 schools and colleges and 326,000 churches where my people worship God as they please. I'm a ballot dropped in a box, the roar of a crowd in a stadium and the voice of a choir in a cathedral. I am an editorial in a newspaper and I'm a letter to a congressman. I'm Eli Whitney and Stephen Foster. I'm Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein. Billy Graham. I am Horace Greeley, Will Rogers, and the Wright brothers. I'm George Washington Carver, Daniel Webster, and Jonas Salk. I'm Longfellow, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Walt Whitman, Thomas Paine, Tom Sawyer, and Walt Disney. Yes, I am the nation, and these are the things that I am. I was conceived in freedom, and God willing, in freedom, I'll spend the rest of my days. May I possess always the integrity the courage and the strength to keep myself unshackled, to remain a citadel of freedom and a beacon of hope to the entire world. I am.